Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine, a Canadian podcast covering our nation's creepier side. My name is Mike Brown, creator and host. With me is my good friend, co-host, and wispy-boned sound engineer, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, everybody. Oh, he's sounding very, very uh, deep-voiced. He's uh, taken up smoking and uh, drinking glass. How do you drink glass? Uh, well, you have to smash it up first. Oh, yeah. No, if I'm being honest, I'm just, I'm sick. Scott has been very sick. Scott has a cold. But I'm willing to do it for the podcast. Just listen go. to this voice. Wow. Yeah, right? It's just mind-boggling. Right? Uh, I have been not well as also. Different effects, though, though. I don't think yeah. that people need us to cover. Yeah. I was... <laughs> Let's let's just say I was sitting down a lot. Yeah. All right. Thanks to all those who listened to our first episode. Uh, thank you for your likes, follows, and kind comments. I mean, I was so blown away. Oh, I, it was just made it made my week when uh, all the feedback and support yeah. everybody showed us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the podcast community, people we don't even know, have been so nice and uh, accepting, and uh, and you know allowing us to be a part of that community. I really am grateful. Um, and we're excited to keep doing this. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this quantity of positive feedback after not because I saw flaw or anything with what we were doing, just your initial one, you expect there to be, uh, some, uh, critical feedback and stuff, but which I'm sure there is, but, yeah, uh, but, it's but all, still, it's all it was just you, the, the, so. the love and the, <laughs> as it should be yeah uh, i just the love and the support from everybody the community our friends it was just really really wonderful so big, yep. big thanks to you all you sexy beasts well let's get to it dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish as our content contains mature themes harsh language and graphic descriptions of violent crimes listener discretion is strongly advised put on your toque grab a double double and an animal bar it's time to scarf down some dark poutine This episode, we tackle another case uh, here in British Columbia, just up the number one highway, is a city of about 180,000 called Abbotsford. Uh, we chose this case as our second a few weeks ago and mentioned it at the end of episode one, but uh, a horrific event has brought Abbotsford into the dark side of the news once again. A few days ago, Abbotsford Police Constable John Davidson was shot and killed during an altercation with a suspected car thief who'd already discharged his firearm. Uh, the suspect fled, but was later apprehended by members of the Abbotsford Police Service after a high-speed chase that ended with more gunfire. Constable Davidson, who leaves behind his wife and three adult children, started his career as a cop in the UK in 1993, but moved to Abbotsford as a member of their department in 2006. We'd like to extend our condolences to Constable Davidson's family, uh, colleagues, friends, and the entire community of Abbotsford. This was a horrible loss. Uh, we considered holding off on this case out of respect for the fallen officer, but after some careful thought, we decided to forge ahead. Um, we hope our podcast in some small way honors the memory of Constable Davidson and highlights his courage and uh, the tenacity of his fellow officers in the Abbotsford Police Department who continue to protect with pride. Yeah, this, this case really highlights some of the brilliant detective work 
done by that group. So that's right. Yeah. So uh, it is kind of timely. Uh, we didn't choose it after this event uh, just to to get more listens. It just kind of happened this way. Yeah, so Abbotsford does have some history of violent crime. In fact, in 2008 and 2009, it had the highest homicide rate in cities its size across the country. Yeah, it's it's really quite – I wouldn't have expected that. It's uh, I've always thought favorably of it. Not to say I don't now, but I've always viewed it yeah. as like a, a, a wonderful and, and – uh, peaceful community. I think a lot of it has to do with some gang violence, though, in the sure in in, in our, yep. our community. And you know, obviously, the opioid crisis is very strong here in uh, in uh, British Columbia. So, yeah. um, and with that comes a, few, a little bit of violence. Um, I've heard it jokingly called Stabbitsford. Ooh. Uh, I'm sure the fine, upstanding folks in the city are not amused by that nickname. Uh, Everyone I've met there are kind of kind and down-to-earth folks, and uh, they wouldn't take that lightly. Yeah, I, I can support that 100%. I, I know many, many a fantastic person from that community. Yeah. All that said, Abbotsford seems like a nice place to live. It's uh, far enough from the hustle and bustle of Vancouver to have a nice, easier pace, but close enough that you could commute to and from the big city every day. The killer we're talking about in tonight's case is Abbotsford's most notorious in the last 25 years. The horrific murder of 16-year-old Tanya Smith and brutal, near-fatal beating of Tanya's best friend Misty Cockrell weren't enough for this creep. He still had a few nasty tricks up his sleeve. Yes, man, oh man, did he. This is the case of the Abbotsford killer. On Friday 13th, 1995, 16-year-old Tanya Smith and 15-year-old Misty Cockrell had just spent the evening with some friends at a park here in Surrey. Not wanting to go home just yet, they decided to head over to another party in Abbotsford, just five blocks from Misty's place. The girls even joked about the fact that it was Friday the 13th and that they might meet a maniac. Jeez. Yeah. Hey. A car passed the girls slowly and turned in a block ahead. They didn't see who was inside. Almost immediately, a wild-eyed man appeared before them brandishing a baseball bat. He growled, You bitches want a party? Before they could respond, he pushed the two girls through the 12-foot hedgerow he'd come out of into the dimly lit back parking lot of the local hospital on the other side of the shrubs. Holding his bat above his head, he demanded the girls strip off their clothes. Tanya complied, Misty did not. Instead of running away, Misty stood frozen in horror at what she was witnessing. She faked an asthma attack to distract the assailant, but he called her on it saying, You're faking. If you really had asthma, you'd have a puffer with you. And he continued to brutalize Tanya. Misty had enough, later saying the horrified look on her friend's face prompted her to act. Missy leapt for the bat and struck the man on the shoulder. He rose quickly and deflected the second swing easily, taking the bat from Misty. As Misty pleaded for her life and yelled for Tanya to run, the man beat Misty with the bat until she lost consciousness. Just a, just a horrendous, horrendous act. Like, it, it's, it, you try to put yourself in their shoes you and just, it, it's... This thing comes out of nowhere. Just the, Yeah, it, it's just disgusting and terrifying and I... I couldn't imagine being in her shoes, and I have nothing but empathy. Yeah. Misty remembers coming to next to Tanya on the ground and telling her they needed to get up. Severely concussed, Misty stumbled away to go home to get some rest. Lucky for her in her day's state, instead of ending up at home, at 4.30 a.m., Misty Cockrell wobbled bloody, battered, and near hypothermic through the emergency department doors of the hospital they had been so close to. Tanya was not with her. Despite what had been called a fist-sized hole in her head, Misty remained conscious for the moment and related her horrible tale of rape and assault to the nurses who then called police. This sparked what would turn out to be the most public investigation the Abbotsford police had ever been involved in. There were many questions that needed answering, but foremost, where was Tanya Smith? Tragically, around 8 o'clock that morning, 20 kilometers away in the Vetter Canal, the answer came. Two friends fishing in the canal found the naked body of a female floating face down. The shaken fisherman immediately called 911. 
the responding Chilliwack RCMP began a homicide investigation finding women's clothes in the bushes nearby. Abbotsford police detectives quickly arrived with a photo of Tanya and made a positive ID. Oh, God. Like, fear the worst and it happened, right? Oh, man. Completely. Yeah. As well, the unenviable task of telling Tanya's parents that their daughter had been murdered and that they did not have a suspect in mind. This appeared to be a stranger-on-stranger murder. These are the hardest to solve. The Chilliwack RCMP and Abbotsford Police uh, formed a joint task force and got to work immediately investigating every possible lead and scenario, carefully preserving the evidence from the crime scenes. Witnesses said a white van was seen in the area earlier that morning. Nobody knew whether that had any relevance or not. Misty's condition worsened. Swelling on the brain, she was moved to Royal Columbian Hospital under armed police protection. The people Tanya and Misty had been partying with were questioned. Cops also considered the usual suspects, you know, people who were recently released from Matsqui, the federal penal institution located in Abbotsford, and others with records involving violence and or sex offenses. And the media firestorm started right away. All the elements were there. One teenage girl had been raped, murdered, and dumped in a canal, and another was beaten almost to death, laying in the hospital fighting for her life. The memories of Paul Bernardo, Scarborough rapist and serial killer of Ontario schoolgirls, were still fresh in the minds of many Canadians. Could it be happening again? People were instantly terrified. I really remember this. Well, yeah, yeah it, it and it didn't only impact Abbotsford. The yeah. the fear. Yeah, uh, it like it. I remember working out of Vancouver, and it's all anybody was talking. Like it was just the whole lower mainland, the whole yeah. area. It was just yeah. It was it got worse too. Eh? Tanya Smith's autopsy revealed a wealth of evidence that could be matched to a suspect, including DNA. Some details police held back from the media to weed out false confessions and have a better chance of identifying Tanya's real killer. It also uncovered the fact that the cause of death had been drowning. Tanya was unconscious but alive when she was put into the canal face down. This guy must be a monster. Oh, dis- it's just terrifying. Yeah. Five days after the attacks, on the morning of October 18th, 1995, the first first call came. Which is my birthday, by the way. First, first link. Oh, wow. That's weird. Yeah. Right? Well, it's also weird that you have a birthday. I thought you were hatched. That is not weird. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the caller spoke to one of the members of the Joint Task Force investigating the case. He claimed that he had helped Misty get into the hospital that night and uh, uh, the night of the crimes. Okay. Uh, They tried to convince him to come in and chat, of course, uh, but he refused and hung up, of course. Uh, The police traced the call to a convenience store's payphone and made note of the tip. At 4.30 the same afternoon, another call came in. This time they recorded it. Here's some audio of the cocky killer's voice. Just to let you know who I am, Tanya's right tasted really good. Yikes. He said he was the killer and talked about the site of the initial attack and mentioned having bitten Tanya's right nipple. That was the piece of evidence that uh, the police held back. Like if that if that doesn't give you shivers, chills, yeah, that's just terrifying hearing that. Like, he's taunting them already. Oh, it, it, absolutely. Yeah. Police swarmed to the phone booth outside the MSA hockey arena to attempt uh, to gather evidence and per- perhaps catch the suspect. Uh, and if lucky, a fingerprint belonging to someone already in their database. No prints, and no one had been seen by anyone. Less than two hours later, a little after 6 p.m., there was another phone call, and this time to 911. The arrogant caller made fun of the police efforts to ID him. Here's a little more audio. Do you think I would be stupid enough to leave fingerprints behind when I make a phone call? If that wasn't enough, he wasn't done. At 6.30 on the same day, he called a fourth time. Again, he called 911. His message was more chilling. After asking if they were having trouble finding the killer, he said the following. I'm the one. They're giving me the chance to try and find me. I'll be scoozing around looking for someone else. The audio isn't good on that one. He says, I'm the one giving you the chance to try and find me. I'll be cruising around looking for someone else. Here it is again, just in case you want to hear it. 
Yeah, I, I that's what, uh, these calls yeah. are what made things go from scary having the yeah. community terrified totally. to people not going out, people yeah. afraid to yeah. uh, for, all across the Lower Mainland. Nobody, yeah. it, it was just this sheer was panic. Five days after the attack, yeah. too. So was, it was still fresh. Absolutely, you know, it was still on everybody's mind, and yeah, it, it just sh- it, from my perspective, it just shut down the Lower Mainland. Yeah. Police were afraid that he was going to do it again. Uh, The cops alerted the media to tell the public they were cautioning the public to take extra precautions to protect their safety. Yikes. Yeah, exactly what I'm talking about. Like, it's, it just, yeah, it it just set so much panic across the town. Yeah. On October 21st, Tanya's family laid their beloved daughter to rest. Many family, friends, and concerned locals attended. The police were there recording video of everyone mourning the passing of the teen with the hope that they might catch a glimpse of Tanya's killer in the crowd. He was there, but that wouldn't be known for some time. The ordeal was just beginning for the terrified residents in the community of Abbotsford, the Fraser Valley, and the Lower Mainland. So cops got to work, you know. Uh, They called in the profilers and all those kind of folks like you would see on the recent... uh, Mind Hunter. Mind Hunter, yep. And they were trying to figure out what kind of guy is this who would do this kind of thing. Not only would he uh, murder and rape somebody and, and almost kill someone else, but uh, then he would call and taunt the police about it. Um, so for our American listeners, uh, the RCMP is like our FBI. So uh, the FBI quote unquote <laughs> profiler was brought in so our RCM RCMP profiler was brought in from Ottawa which is the capital of Canada for those who don't know it's not Toronto and the Leafs suck <laughs> evidence from the crime itself was valuable obviously uh, the actions he took after the attacks specifically the phone calls indicated some disturbing things he appeared to enjoy the attention the killer called again He said some more disturbing things, surprise, again mentioning a right nipple and having bitten it, so it's kind of his signature now. Yeah. He sounded extremely excited on the call, more so than the last few. Cops suspected he may have been masturbating when he called. I have no words. No. They traced the call to a payphone outside a local bar. Once again, no one had seen the suspect using the phone. Oh boy! Yeah, the the amount of psychological terror he's uh, inflicting, right? Is, is like I could just remember. I just remember just like they 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 told us every time that he called them. The cops told the the media, and the media told us, and it was yep. in the paper. And yep. it was. I mean, there was no internet really at the time, unless you were some nerd who was like on a bulletin board. Yeah, not me. No, me neither. Not saying I'm not a nerd. Well, that's true. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, on November 6, 1995, the Joint Task Force called a press conference. They shared a composite drawing created by a forensic sketch artist based on Misty's memory of the attacker. Police also shared some carefully edited audio from the tapes they had made of these calls. Yeah. And they excluded some things, obviously, because they didn't want everybody to know the identifying things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, They even set up an 800 number so people could listen to the calls again. If you called more than three times, you could expect a knock on your door from investigators looking to chat. Understandably. Yeah. Yeah. People were terrified. Yeah. Absolutely terrified and understandably so. Yeah. Uh, We even, Carol and I, my wife... We even knew somebody who resembled the composite drawing. Uh, And apparently he, somebody had called him in as a suspect. He looked a lot like this guy. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He's he's like a dead ringer for, uh, uh, for the composite. And uh, he was... Was it you? It was not me. I don't look anything like that composite. Well, Well, the mustache. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So he was interviewed by police very thoroughly. Hmm, Wow. Yeah. And obviously a lot of people were who looked like that were turned in and uh, people had conversations about yeah. voices and all that kind of thing. 
So Misty Cockrell, who still had a long road of recovery ahead of her uh, in mid-November, she and her family were placed into witness protection because the cops didn't want uh, to take any chances with their star witness, especially with this cuckoo still on the loose. Yeah, he's not. It's not like he's somebody who's uh, laying low. No. Uh, so over the next four months, investigators spent time following leads, interviewing possible suspects, but the killer still eluded them, and he went quiet for a time. Uh, they heard nothing more from him until February 17th, 1996. He couldn't contain himself, I guess. No, uh, yeah, many more, can't. Yeah, more attention, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. This time it wasn't just a phone call, although that was part of it. A phone call came into a local radio station. I remember this really well, too. Yep. Uh, a mail caller told the DJ that uh, he should go out and check the station's logoed car in the parking lot. Someone had done something to it. And the DJ went outside and found a gravestone on the hood of his car. Uh, it was Tanya Smith's. Just like I, I get chills it, as we go over so many of these details because the memory is so vivid. Yeah. And it's just it's so terrifying. Like, I know I keep. I keep saying this, but it's just, yeah. It, it this just point terrifying. is what got me too, because like this girl was, she. this was his murder victim. And he, he desecrated her grave. He took her gravestone and he, he in broad daylight, it, plopped it on the, the hood of a car and got away with it. Like how brazen is that? That in broad daylight, you've just murdered somebody. Um, you know, you murdered somebody four or five months ago, and uh, now you desecrate their grave and plop their gravestone onto a car and, and make a phone call about it. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, many criminals end up with remorse about what they're, whether it's burglary or murder, they end up with a lot of remorse about it. But yeah. in this case, the killer, it was painfully obvious, was proud about what he had done. Yeah. He's relishing in it. Yeah. He's loving it. And, and he's... He's taking every advantage he can to continue to relive it and punish yeah. the victims and the city. Yeah. So the stone was the the kind with the, the picture on it, you know, those gravestones mm. with somebody's photo. Yep. And so Tanya's face was on the photo. But so he had scribbled in pen on, the, on her photo uh, a list. And so here's the four-point list. She was not the first. She won't be the last. That's point one. Jeez. Point two is I'm still looking. Uh, point three is one day misty. Like, come on. <sighs> Again, the the sense of pride he's getting in, in yeah. like no wonder punishing. Got, they, no wonder they've got misty cockerel in uh, in protective oh, custody. Absolutely. You know? And the the fourth point, of course, you won't find me. Yeah, which thankfully, yeah, is not accurate. And so he had drawn arrows that pointed to Tanya's right breast, uh, over which was written something that, you know, I thought I've debated whether or not to say it because I'm so disgusted by it, especially like the the context of it. But I'll just say it. So essentially he wrote uh, yummy tit. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel the same way about the phrase but yeah. it is important that we yeah. I, I feel that it's important that yeah. we be true to the to the events yeah so obviously again his signature so he's again uh referring to the fact that he bit tanya on the right breast Oy. yeah i don't like him no no yeah well neither do i no um so it was in broad daylight he must have felt like untouchable oh Again, he fe- the, the the pride he feels and confidence in it all. Yeah. What he's saying, you're not going to catch me. He truly believes it. Yeah. Which is often the downfall of a lot of serial criminals. Yeah. So two days later, on February 19th, 1996, another call came to 911. Here's a bit of the audio. Just to let you know who I am, Tanya's right tasted really good. How'd you like the present I gave you guys? That was, this stuff is really Uh. winding him up. He also said again, this won't be the last. Uh, He was watching them as they were looking for him. Oh, yeah. The cops had to be, like, infuriated. They had to be so pissed. Well, yes, but I I also think in some vein they probably welcome it because the more somebody, the more a killer, a criminal. Yep. 
is willing to take these risks, yep. the more likely they are to be caught. Yeah, he has. So it's giving them a lot more uh, uh, info needed to, yeah. to to try to catch him. So like, unlike BTK, he hasn't just disappeared for years and years and years yeah. and gone underground. Uh, although he is a lot like BTK, strangely. Mm. His behavior, like with wanting attention and those kind of things, he just didn't have the self control seemingly yeah. that BTK had. Well, there was that tiny lull, uh, 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 it, four months. Yeah, uh, but he just—I guess he probably he needed the attention. Yep. Uh, this time, people had seen a car, but no maker model and no license plate. Of course, mm. the description they got from a witness was the vehicle was a late seventies or early eighties beige American sedan. Like, how much more beige actually can you get in a description? Yeah, like so, like it was a car. Yeah. So they. They added that to their next sketch, you know, this this beige car. Uh, yeah. yeah, crazy. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, two days after the last phone call, um, a woman at home alone with her children called police. Someone had just thrown something through her front picture window. Jeez. You know, can you imagine, yeah. like, you're, uh, you're at home alone with your kids uh, and some things come smashing through the window and and undoubtedly already on edge because of how like what's going on you 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 couldn't not be impacted by this and so then for suddenly at home alone or at home with your child and smash something through the window like that's just gonna yeah and uh so uh police found the object it was a uh, dark blue envelope scotch taped to a heavy adjustable wrench Clear instructions were printed on the envelope with black Sharpie from the Abbey Killer. Call 911. So she did exactly what he told her to do. Oh, holy crap. Well, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have to put those instructions on there, I'm sure. Yeah. It, but it just his his cry for the attention. Like yeah. he wants them to call the police because he wants them to make it public and he wants to be able to get that gratification. Yeah. Uh, again, no one from the neighborhood saw anything, of course. So in the in the envelope was a note. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the full text of the note before we talk about it. Uh, you know, some of the language in this note is really disturbing, obviously. Some is even racist. Uh, listener beware. The person writing this note is clearly not a good guy. And these are not our words. I repeat, I did not write this. I don't want anybody to think this comes from my brain. And so here we go. Hello, it's me. Yes, sir. Re Tanya's right nipple sure did taste good. By the way, Tanya was wearing sandals that night and I threw them with her other stuff. She wasn't a bad lay either. It was me that phoned from the rotary that night. You cops getting a little pissed off yet? Hard to catch somebody who is smart, not like some stupid crooks that are no minds. Here are a few more of my conquests. I told you it wasn't my first. It won't be the last either. I don't stay with the same MO. I have done more after these ones also. Go figure out which ones look in BC, Alberta, and a few in Washington State. How come you guys haven't clued in to some of the incidents here in town the last couple of years? Re- Burquin Crescent by McDonald's. Teen who was attempted sex assault. I grabbed her breasts and was about to gag her when she took off on me. Oriel Drive. I almost had that woman beat senseless with, and was about to rape her when a car came along. I sure don't need to be seen. How about right across from the hospital? Hey, that was the same bat that was used on Misty and Tanya. As soon as I saw it was an Indian, I said no way could have AIDS. So I took her backpack, found $200 in it, and threw it atop an old brick store. Hey guys, I'm bad. I will strike again one day. I will not be caught. I will not move from Abbotsford. Bye guys, this is the last time you'll hear from me till next time. Good luck. Holy crap. Yeah. You know, I've never read the... uh, Never read that full text. This is the very first time I've I've read that full text. I've heard bits yeah. of it, and it's just you, so he's. I mean, so he starts off, you know, obviously with his signature again, saying "Hello, it's me," and talking about her her nipple, and more proof that it's him is uh, the fact that uh, they mentioned first that 
Tanya was wearing shoes and not sandals, but uh, he would have been the only one who knew that. Uh, well, the, some of the other stuff I don't even really want to talk about. It's disgusting. The, um, the, to I, I feel like in situations like with individuals like this, I, I there's that part of me that wants to take shots at them in in the sense of like there's such irony in it's hard to catch someone who's so smart but then uses in that same sentence glaring grammatical air. Yeah, he's it, not, he's not super great with his. Uh, you you can tell it's all about him yeah. convincing himself, hyping himself up, yeah. and and I don't believe uh, the parts where he gave detail. Yeah, I, I believe, and I do, if, if I recall, uh, were substantiated. But then the things of I've done it before, I'll do it again in his other place, like with no detail. Yeah, why when you're seeking attention would you not specify, give more details about those other things, uh-huh. but then the attempts you do so it's just just a delusional mind yeah just a de- absolutely delusional mind like scooters yeah yeah so there's three other attacks that he refers to in there um you know uh, not only is he giving hints to crimes the police were already investigating uh, that there were living witnesses for yeah um they uh, also found a new piece of evidence um a fingerprint, a full fingerprint on the uh, a piece of the tape. So they had a print. Mm. So here's some ID on the guy, some actual yep. ID. Um, obviously, they ran it through their database with no no joy. So his prints weren't in the national database, and apparently they ran it through the U.S. one as well with no luck. Mm. So, but again, it's that whole. Um the more he reacts, yeah. the more he uh, seeks that attention, the more he gives away. Yep. Uh, the victim of the assault that took place near McDonald's had not seen the attacker's face, uh, but she did note that his arm was freckled and had red hair, red hair so more identifying yeah. information. As well, uh, she worked with a sketch artist to draw an anchor tattoo that she'd seen on his arm. Yep. Uh, The woman from the attack on Oriel Drive uh, could provide no help. She'd been bashed in the head from behind when a car approached her attacker scurried away. Uh, The third one was like a very much like uh, 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 Tanya Smith's murder, actually. So uh, August 8th, 1995, so 67 days before um, the actual murder of Tanya Smith. Yep. uh, An attack on Misty Cockrell. Um, this woman came stumbling into the exact same hospital that Misty stumbled into. Uh, she had just arrived from Saskatchewan with her boyfriend, and uh, although her background is Norwegian, she had been mistaken for sometimes for uh, a native Indian. So that's why he made that remark about Indians, I mm-hmm. would assume. Mm-hmm. Indians in quotes. Um On the night in question, she'd been drinking at a bar with her boyfriend. Apparently, they had an argument, and she left and and began walking when she couldn't find a taxi. And then she was attacked. So uh, he beat her so badly that she now has a large dent in her skull. So that's that's nice. Yeah. 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 She's got permanent brain damage, has lost her sense of smell, her balance is unstable, and she cannot walk any distance because of a dropped foot, and she's unable to work. She barely survives on a disability pension. In short, her quality of life was ruined. Just, just terrible. Yeah. Poor, poor, poor girl. Like, it's just... Yeah. It, just a completely innocent person. Yeah. Suddenly their life is changed. And you can really see his progression when yeah. you're looking through this all you can really th- see how it was escalating yeah like it was escalating before the attack on tanya yeah the severity of it yeah. kind of going from uh you know grabbing to hitting mm-hmm. to uh, yeah. yeah yeah i just like i keep thinking of how lucky misty cockerel is just uh, well i mean in many regards not lucky to have but had to go to through it but to survive it's amazing to strength people show. Yeah. You know, like it's just, it's what, what an amazing person. It blows my mind. Yeah. Like that's, that's resilience right there. Absolutely. So, uh, in late March, um, 
obviously the cops had had enough of this nonsense and and they you know among other investigation they decided to try and trap the killer so they wanted to bait him into calling them again yep yeah. yep so they set up around all the pay phones everywhere and uh um they did some media stuff i can't remember exactly what it was i i have some I have some recollection. Okay. If I'm remi- remi- remembering sure. the right, uh, they I believe they had said that they have video uh, of what they believe to be the suspect uh, at a at a convenience store oh, or something. And I believe they set up booths, only a few booths mm-hmm. at uh, instead of showing it on TV, they set up a few booths at uh, a few malls. Okay. And ask the public to come and view because you know how this guy wants attention yeah and is so obsessed with this yeah they know that he'll he will go and and go there and you know clearly i i would firmly believe that they would be recording internally to see who's coming to it and uh, just so that they can start to kind of okay well was this person a redhead was yeah. it to really just kind of lure them out to, and to get that person to go there yeah. i i could be incorrect but that's a I do believe that that was this case. That sounds that sounds about right. And really, quite again, it goes to show the the uh, high level of detective work because at this point in time, you know, these were still some pretty pretty new things to do. The behavioral sciences were yeah. still rel- kind of just coming to their their uh, fruition, if you would, or. They they were still relatively new. Not every right. police office uh, would be employing these, and so very very impressed by how Abbotsford uh, the police handled it. So the plan was in place for five tense days with no phone calls from the killer. It's like he knew. Yeah. Although they failed to lure their prey out from under his rock, investigators continued to work the case day and night, following leads and working on profiling the killer as thoroughly as they could. They built, like, geographic profiles, yep. like, psychological profiles. Oh, God. I can't, yeah. You know? Like, I can't imagine the work that these guys had to put in. Yeah. And sleepless, too. Like, you're you're after this guy who you know is going to do something again. Well, one of the fears about trying to apprehend a person like this is if you start going in the wrong direction, if your uh, ideas are wrong... And you're taking the case in the wrong direction. You're very hyper aware of the fact that more innocent people may die. Yeah. Like it's live. There's lives hinging on the decisions you're making. And good yeah. luck sleeping with that. You know. Yeah. So on April 30th, 1996, another news conference was held. They have new tapes with cleaned up audio of the killer's voice. And they had a new poster to distribute uh, together with all the identifying info that they had so far. So the new tattoo and the the car and and all that kind of stuff. Um, The red hair and freckles. Yeah. Uh, And they would also introduce a $40,000 reward for the killer's capture. That'll that'll, uh, come into play later on. Yeah. Uh, So that same afternoon, uh, the same afternoon that they released that new audio, a woman and the reward, a woman called in stating that she thought the voice on the tape sounded a lot like her son. Yep. His name was Terry Driver. She and other, her other son had listened and agreed that uh, they should call the police, even though he didn't look much like the man in the sketch. So. Um, she said that Terry liked to cruise around Abbotsford listening to his mobile police scanner. <laughs> Days after the murder, he had words with his brother saying, don't fuck with me. You don't know me anymore. You don't know what I am capable of doing. True. Yeah. Jeez. Terry Driver lived only one block from the hockey stadium that a few of the killer's taunting calls had come from. Which is a, a typical thing for for. Serial criminals. Yeah, do stuff near home. Yeah, because you know it well. You you can escape, you can hide, you can... Police acted right away. Um, they drove to Terry's house and waited for him to get home from work. Uh, but when they saw him, his mother was right. He didn't look much like the composite, so they decided not to take him down hard, just question him first, get a feel for him, you know? Mm-hmm. They waited for him to go inside, and a few minutes later, they were knocking on the door. 
When Terry answered, they told him someone identified him as a person of interest and they had to clear him. Terry mentioned he looked nothing like the composite drawing, but agreed to chat. Terry said he was trick-or-treating with the kids on Halloween the night of one of the phone calls, but he did admit to having fished in the Vetter River near where Tanya's body was found. Lots of folks did. When asked if he would provide DNA or fingerprints, what did Terry do? Oh, uh, he said, great, uh, let me provide it? Nope, he, no. de- he declined. Yeah, huge red flag. Huge. Uh, they wanted to look further into Terry Driver, obviously. <laughs> uh, the, they again tried to get him to provide DNA and fingerprints that same night uh, via phone call, and he continued to decline. Oh, wow. However, a few days later, Terry Driver and his lawyer came into the police station. He was finally willing to provide fingerprints. Guess what? What's that? His print matched. Oh, well, that's concerning. Interesting. Yeah, so his print matched the one they found on the scotch tape mm-hmm. attached to the envelope and the uh, uh, adjustable wrench with yeah. the horrible note. Uh, so they had a conversation with him about uh, what was going on, and they arrested him. Mm-hmm. And he was completely unemotional as he was arrested for the murder of Tanya Smith and attempted murder of Misty Cockrell. Yeah, not surprising. Yep. They went to work gathering more evidence, by the way, search warrants on Terry's property to help uh, build a more solid case for trial. But this was not the end of this saga, although holy crap. (laughs) Is it not enough? (laughs) Right? This isn't the end of the saga, but this is the end of this episode. So this is only part one of the Abbotsford Killer. Next time, we'll get into more about Terry Driver's life, history, and walk through his trial and the aftermath of that. Yeah, and that's where I'll talk a lot more about how I was uh, pulled into it, shall we say, my connections to the case and Terry Driver and and just, yeah, my component, my personal component into this case. Okay, I don't even really know. Well, you're gonna. Yeah, I haven't, we haven't actually discussed this. So we may find that Scott is Toonie Loons next time. (laughs) Well, you you wouldn't need to hear me say anything further to know I'm a little uh, Toonie Loons. Okay. All right. If you'd like to learn more about this and other episodes of Dark Poutine, check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com. If you have any story ideas, questions, comments, or just want to say hi, you can reach us via email at darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you wouldn't mind, please tell your friends about us. Also, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory. If you're so inclined, it would be awesome if you left a five-star review. A few did. Thank you very much. And uh, positive comments on iTunes. Thank you, folks, so much. Every little bit helps. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. (laughs) 